This episode is sponsored by Cash App. When your personal finances connect you to your funds and the things that matter, that's money and that's Cash App. You know what else is money? The sound of brown ground round. The selfless act of potato ricing and whatever this feeling is. That's money, that's Cash App. Download Cash App from the App Store or Google Play Store today to add your cash tag to the 80 million and counting. Alright, so the first step in the direction of homemade pierogies is homemade pierogi dough, an enriched, easy to work with pasta dough that starts with 650 grams of all-purpose flour and about a teaspoon of kosher salt, tiny whisked to a state of combination. Then over on the stovetop, we're barely melting one stick or about 115 grams of unsalted butter, adding one cup or 240 ml of water, hopefully bringing the ambient temperature of the mixture to about 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Now as we so often do, we're going to add the wet to the dry along with some more wet, two large room temperature eggs. Go ahead and beat that together with a fork slowly incorporating more and more of the flour into the mixture until you just can't fork it no more and you gotta switch to hands. Now this should be a soft, tacky dough, but as you start to bring it together, you might discover that it needs more flour or water. Basically, if it's sticking to your hands, it needs more flour. If it's tough, dry, and crumbly, it needs more water. Add more 50 to 25 grams at a time or a few tablespoons at a time until it's soft, tacky, bouncy, and supple, kind of like a dough for a loaf of sandwich bread. Once you've kneaded it for about five or six minutes and the gluten is well developed, you can place it back in the bowl and cover it with a moistened towel towel, keeping it hydrated and letting it rest for 30 minutes at room temperature, giving the gluten an opportunity to relax before we make like ludicrous and roll out. Sorry. We're dividing the dough into four pieces, keeping the others covered until ready to roll, and one hunk at a time, rolling to a thickness of about 1 16th of an inch or 1.5 millimeters. Then we're using a 3.5 inch or a 8.8 a, a centimeter biscuit cutter to cut into rounds, ready for shaping and filling. As you can see, I'm laying these out on layers of parchment paper, and I'm going to keep them covered in the fridge until they're ready to fill. Speaking of which, we got to make some fillings, starting with perhaps the most classic and essential potato. As you can see, I have here four large Yukon Gold potatoes that I've peeled and chopped into 1 inch pieces, covered with cold water, seasoned with salt, brought to a boil, and cooked for about 12 minutes until completely tender. Then once very thoroughly drained, you can either mash them or, for an ultra-smooth consistency, rice them. Either way, you want to break them down into a mashed potato state of being before adding 8 ounces or 225 grams of cheese. Traditionally farmer's cheese or cork, you can just use cream cheese in a pinch or the soft, tangy cheese of your choice. Don't forget to season generously with kosher salt and gently mix until evenly combined and no streaks of cheese remain. And that's all there is to it. You just gotta let this cool at least to room temperature or for a few hours in the fridge before filling. Next up, the ever-popular mushroom and sauerkraut varietal, for which we're going to need half a finely chopped onion, 12 ounces or about 340 grams of finely chopped mushrooms, and one cup or one metric handful of drained and dried sauerkraut, lightly chopped to make sure that there aren't any long stringies. Now over on the stovetop, I'm going to cook the mushrooms and a few tablespoons of unsalted butter. Then after about 7 to 10 minutes, depending on your mushrooms, once all of their liquid has been released and evaporated and they're starting to sizzle, we're adding the chopped onion and sauteing for an additional 3 to 5 minutes until everybody's nicely caramelized, adding our sauerkraut and cooking for an additional few minutes until any added liquid from the sauerkraut has evaporated. Season to taste with kosher salt and likewise let cool to room temperature. Next and last, a simple ground beef filling, and I do mean simple. One pound or 450 grams of crumbled ground beef that we're going to brown in a few tablespoons of neutral flavored oil, ideally trying not to overcrowd the pan so it doesn't boil and steam. Once lightly browned but still pink in parts, we're going to scoop it out using a slotted spoon and saute another chopped half onion in the remaining fat for about three to five minutes before adding a crushed clove of garlic, sauteing for an additional 30 seconds or until fragrant, then adding the beef back to the pan along with a half cup or 115 ml of beef stock then cooking this guy for about another 5 minutes until most of the beef stock has evaporated but it's still a little saucy. Season to taste with kosher salt and freshly ground pepper, set aside and let cool. Now finally it's time to fill. As you can see I'm using a little ice cream scooper for consistency's sake, placing a big dollop in the center of the dough round and gently stretching the dough across its center axis, pinching it first in the center and then around the outside edge to seal shut. Now this is a very soft malleable dough so you don't need an egg or water wash to seal your dumpling, but you do kind of want to press and smear the edge closed so that nobody explodes in the void water. Now the other filling is a little bit more crumbly and unwieldy, but the procedure is very much the same. Keep going until all your dough's been dumped. Now these guys are ready to cook and prepare as is, get tightly covered and refrigerated for up to overnight, or get placed loose in the freezer like this until frozen solid about four hours, then plopped in an airtight bag and frozen for up to three months. If preparing from frozen, you just want to boil them for 30 to 
60 seconds longer to make sure that they're heated through. Now, pierogies are most often served with sour cream and applesauce. If you feel like making your own sour cream for some reason, we got this recipe from Bigger Boulder Baking, where we're combining a cup of heavy cream, a quarter cup of milk, and a teaspoon of white vinegar, tiny whisking to ensure homogeneity, and covering with a few layers of cheesecloth secured by a rubber band. Now you want to let this guy sit out for at least 12 hours, illustrated here by this seamless television style swap, after which you can see our cream has thickened to a drizzleable consistency. Now this isn't real sour cream, it's more like creme fraiche, but it's still going to make for an excellent condiment for our rogies. Next up, applesauce, and this is one more worth making yourself because you can control the sweetness. As you can see, I've got six large baking apples that I've peeled and chopped into one inch pieces, which I'm going to combine in a large wide saucepan with a quarter cup of white sugar, a teaspoon of kosher salt, and a half cup of very fresh water. Cover and bring to a simmer, lowering the heat to maintain a simmer for about 20 minutes with the lid on. Pop the lid off, give everybody a solid mash down to an applesauce-like consistency, and cook for an additional 10 minutes lid off, or until any excessive liquid has evaporated. And there you go, pierogi perfect semi-savory homemade applesauce. Now before we set up our pierogi cooking station, I'm going to saute an additional half chopped onion, about 5 minutes or until lightly browned, and then positioning a non-stick pan, preheating with a few tablespoons of neutral flavored oil next to a pot of well-salted boiling water. You can of course just boil and serve pierogies as is, but I like them lightly browned. Once the pierogi have cooked for about 30 seconds or 60 to 90 seconds if they're frozen, we're going to fish them out, shake off as much excess water as possible, and plop them into the skillet. All that water can cause some serious oil spatters, so make sure that you drain the pierogi as best you can. Fry on one side for about a minute until lightly browned, flip and repeat before plating up and serving immediately. To serve, I'm going to scatter our sautéed onions over top the rogies, drizzle generously with our sort of sour cream, and scatter with fresh parsley, chives, or scallions. And there you have it, a perfect plate of pierogi, one of my very favorite comfort foods prepared to the most delicious extent possible. Like I said, the dough for these guys is very forgiving, so if you're looking for a good introductory pasta course, this is it. Hope you guys give this a try for yourselves, and I hope your 2023 is off to a great start. Thanks again to Cash App. That's money, that's Cash App. Download Cash App from the App Store or Google Play Store today to add your cash tag to the 80 million and counting.